Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we will be discussing Book 1, Chapter 5 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Books of the Fallen. This is Part 3 of our coverage of this chapter. You had said this would be 12 parts to cover this chapter. <laughs> yes. it, it will be, in Jokingly. fact, four parts to cover okay. this chapter. I believe this is our first four-parter that we've All ever right. done. All right, folks. Welcome to the Thunderdome. <laughs> <laughs> Who run Barter Town? <laughs> I don't know who run Barter Town because I don't know the answer. Master Blaster was. run Barter Master, Town. Okay. I've only seen that once and I just, uh, I don't, I don't like that movie. I like the, I, Road Warrior is the greatest of all, period. Out of that trilogy, Road Warrior is the best. Because I agree. <laughs> just walk away. Just walk away. Just, just <laughs> walk away. <laughs> It's like, wow, he does that really good. It? It's like... yeah. <laughs> this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It is not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know Preach. this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion, so there will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering the portion of that respective book, and since we're just beginning, I'm working really hard to keep it as spoiler-free as possible. You're doing very good. Thank you. As are you, sir. Oh, thank you. I appreciate sure. that. <laughs> Quick warning. Today's episode contains topics not suitable for young listeners. Discretion is advised. Our show is listener support. <laughs> I'm sorry. You kind of got me with that one. That was good. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate that. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. Funny little addendum to you laughing about my warning for children. Mm -hmm. The other day, my kids got on Spotify to do something or other, and apparently in their feed, our podcast showed up, okay. and they started listening to one of our episodes, and they got to that part, and then they turned it off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. You mean that? that uh, wow. <laughs> I, I, wow. I, I don't know if I'm impressed or disappointed, because I'm like, uh, I'm glad your children behave and mind their manners and mind you. It's, I guess it depends on who says that. If you said that, they may be like, oh, dad said that. We can't listen to that. If I'm mm. saying it, they'll be like, hmm, now i got to listen to this if this other guy says it, you know. <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. <laughs> I told them, unless you're reading the books, you're probably not going to enjoy the show. So don't even bother listening to it. And realistically, unless it's one of the older two, and even mm. then, some of the content's pretty rough. Yeah. So yeah. I wouldn't advise that they get into this maybe for a couple more years. Yeah, dude, I wasn't ready to... I don't think I could have read this till I was like mid 20s to 30. No, actually, I take it back, Billy. I was reading Stephen King in the fifth grade. They can handle it. Did Stephen King, I was not reading Stephen King that early. I was a late. <laughs> it warped my fragile little mind. Well, I can imagine it did. The first thing I read was The Stand that uh, my mentor at my dad's, the guy that was his uh, manager of the, of the station until I took over. He was reading The Stand and Traction. And he said his old school tracks with edge upside down, pressed between two things. On a, on a, and so he's reading this upside down in the dark kind of deal. And he could hear footsteps walking in the hallway. Mm. <laughs> so whenever he did the footsteps walking, all his hands in the hair and raise up on my arms like, oh, I get it. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think I read The Stand before I read It. Yeah. I think I read It in the sixth grade the first time. Wow. Yeah, the first thing, mine would have been The Stand. I was probably 18 or 19, though. I didn't know who to read in horror as a young person, except for Lovecraft, and I didn't know where to look. So I eventually got, when I finally got King, I love King, of course. But I don't find him difficult. He captures things so well. I think people are intimidated by I think the issue was more the subject matter. Probably so. Jumping once again, Stephen <laughs> King, this reminds me, I saw a short on YouTube. It was a picture of the clown from It, but it had the spider legs coming out of its back, and it had a child dangling this was one of those animation things you put in your front yard like yeah. a big prop <laughs> for halloween yeah the title was who puts this in their front it was creepy man because the child looked pretty realistic and it, the thing's shaking it around and it's just dangling there he's holding it by the back of the neck i was like oh my god dude I put that in your front yard you're not going to get any trick-or-treaters that made the point <laughs> 
I usually just do that by turning off the ports a lot. In the apartment, my apartment, what's so beautiful about here, we don't have trick-or-treaters because the kids are up at the front and they don't have, like my building is like, is there's no children in this building. So I guess they don't even come over here and knock on these few doors that are down here. So it's not even really, a, since I've moved to the hill country, it's not really a thing in an apartment complex here. The creepiest thing I saw in our neighborhood, there was a guy a couple of years ago, he had a, his floodlight in his driveway on so it was behind him and he had a, a folding table set up in his driveway with buckets of candy on it. And he was sitting at the table completely stationary and he had a fake machete in one hand and a hockey <laughs> mask. He wouldn't move at all. And the kids would walk up and he was just silent and still, and the kids didn't know what to do. And they could tell it wasn't fake. Right. And then they, with trepidation, reach in to one of the buckets and then he <laughs> jump up and then they run back screaming to their parents it was hilarious man i mean that was the creepiest thing oh that's great and the floodlight behind him you couldn't really see his face oh dude it was great that's awesome yeah nice <laughs> right. so three of 12 digressions done within the first five minutes which <laughs> today. chapter five part three <laughs> So um, uh, are, we, are we easily distracted today? Is that what this is? <laughs> we pick up the chapter as Anamander Rake arrived in Brood's camp. The Tistandi had gathered into a silent ring around the central clearing, awaiting Rake's arrival. The black silver-maned dragon blurred even as it landed, with a warm flow of spice-laden air swirling out to all sides as the assembling drew the dragon's shape inward. A moment later, Rake stood and surveyed his kin. The Mib watched as Corlat strode to meet Rake. She had seen Animander Rake but once before, just south of Black Dog Forest, and then from a distance as he spoke with Brood. He had stood then as he did now, tall, implacable, a sword emanating sheer terror hanging down the length of his back, his long silver hair drifting in the breeze. A slight turn of his head was his only acknowledgement of Corlat's approach. My initial impression of this reaction when Corlat walks up looked at this from a human perspective. I thought, mm -hmm. wow, that seems either rude or arrogant, kind of dismissive. Mm -hmm. After thinking about it for a moment, I realized that Mr. Erickson is doing a good job of displaying how alien the Tist and D are to us. How could we possibly understand what beings like this think or what drives them to treat each other this way? That's true. You know, I never took it that way as an, an arrogance thing. It's just kind of, for me, it's like an acknowledgement. You know, it's like somebody walking up behind you that's one of your friends or something or part of your entourage or whatever. And you kind of look over just to just to see them and make sure that's who it is walking up on you. But it's like, that's kind of how I take that in a way. But like you say, I, a lot of it is they've been around each other a long, long time. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of cordialness and a lot of the formalities have disappeared from their interactions. Hmm. I don't know. They haven't seen each other in a while. I would have expected some type of greeting. All he did was turn his head. He didn't right. smile. He didn't sure. say anything. Didn't even say he made eye contact. He just slightly turned his head. So yeah, I thought it was you're dismissive. Did you? Yes. Okay. Right on. Or he's very aloof. I can see that. You know, it's what's funny. I have always taken, you know, I took him as that way, my initial read through of the books. And the second time I read through him, I still felt that way until in, in gardens and until you get to meeting him with Baruch. Mm -hmm. And then you realize this guy has got a lot going on. And I think the second time I went through Gardens of the Moon, I dismissed everything of him, of his arrogance or anything. I think he's world weariness beyond anything we can even imagine. Yeah, we know a lot more about Rake because we've read the, the whole series. Mm -hmm than people that are reading through the first time but given all we know of him now i just thought it was surprising that that's all we see right here yeah. especially since corlat is i would call her his core team in terms of she is in charge when he's not there so he obviously trusts her <laughs> I'm thinking the last time these people were together, was that when Kalam messed all those Tist and D up and the Lord and Rake shows up and gives them like a night off? It's like somebody's got a broke neck and some other stuff. Now you get the night off. You know, it's like, but you got to be back, back to work tomorrow. But I'm expecting you back. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm expecting to see you first thing in the morning, though. It's like, wow. Okay. It's like broke neck or not. You better be back at work for you. Yeah. Is that, that the last, is that the last time they were together? It's like how you imagine the coal mines in Russia during Stalin's <laughs> reign. The tunnel collapses 
okay, y'all can maybe have the night off. Tomorrow we're yeah. back to work. You know, yeah. you got 65 dead miners in the mine, but you know, life is cheap. We're just going to keep going tomorrow. But, exactly. You get a water break. You're going to go back to work. Though. It's like... Yeah. Off to Rake and Corlat's right appeared Brood, Kalor, Dujek, and the others. Tension bristled in the air, yet one that the Mibe recalled as being present at that last meeting years before. Rake was an ascendant as unlike Brood as to make them seem the opposite ends of power's vast spectrum. Rake was an atmosphere, a heart-thudding, terror-threaded presence no one could ignore, much less escape. The Mibe could feel, crawling beneath her very skin, every Reavy spirit awaken in desperation. She thought, the sword, yet more than the sword. Dragnapur in the hands of cold justice, cold and unhuman. Anamander Rake, the only one among us whose presence sparks fear in Kalor's eyes. The only one, except it seems, for Silver Fox, for my daughter. What might Kalor fear most, if not an alliance between the Son of Darkness and Silver Fox? All traces of exhaustion torn away by the thought, the Mibe stepped forward. Kalor's voice boomed, Anamander Rake! I seek your clearest vision. I seek the justice of your sword. Allow none to sway you with sentiment. And that includes Corlett, who would now whisper urgent in your ear. Rake, a lone brow raised, slowly turned to regard Kalor. He said, what else, Kalor, keeps my blade from your black heart, if not sentiment? <laughs> we got some shots fired here. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us how you feel, Rake. <laughs> it's like, wow. Okay. Kalor's lean face assumed a paler shade. He rumbled, I speak of a child. No doubt you sense her power. The foulest of blossoms. Rake interrupted, power? It abounds in this place, Kalor. This camp has become a lodestone. You are right to fear. His gaze swung to the Mibe, who had stopped but a few paces from him. Her steps ceased. His attention was a fierce pressure, power and threat, enough to make her softly gasp, her limbs weakening. Rake said, forces of nature, mother, are indifferent to justice, would you not agree? It was a struggle to reply. She said, I would, Lord of Moonspawn. Rake said, thus it falls to us sentient beings, no matter how unworthy, to impose the moral divide. Her eyes flashed, she asked, does it now? Kalor said, she has spawned the abomination, Rake. He strode closer, his expression twisted with anger as he glared at the Mibe. He said, her vision is stained, understandably, granted, but even that does not exculpate. Eyes still on the Mibe, Rake murmured, Kalor, approach further at your peril. <laughs> Kalor halted. Rake went on. It would appear that my arrival has been anticipated, with the collective desire that I adjudicate what is clearly a complex situation. Brood, with Silver Fox at his side, said, Appearances deceive. Decide what you will, Rake, but I will not countenance Dragnapur's unsheathing in my camp. Across this line, you do not! <laughs> Remember, these guys have a history, too. <laughs> nice reference, too, by the way. There was silence, as explosive as any the Mibe had ever felt. She thought, by the abyss, this could go very, very wrong. Imagine being a mortal, living your relatively short life by these standards, and being in the company of these individuals. I'd feel out of my depth constantly. Oh, absolutely. Yet some of these folks, I, these humans, I think are admired by some of these ascendants and immortals. I was thinking about Dujek as an example. Yes. Because when speaking of tactics with Brood, they were virtually identical in their thought patterns in yeah. terms of how to approach the Panion Domin situation. Yeah. Separately, Whiskey Jack seems to be getting a lot of recognition for the way he is. Yeah. Hey, Corlett's kind of crushing on him, it looks like. Not just Corlett. That's true. That's true. <laughs> the Mibe glanced over at the Malazans. Dujek had drawn his soldier's expressionless mask over his features, but his taut stance revealed his alarm. The standard bearer Artanthos was a step behind and slightly to the right of one arm, a Marine's rain cape drawn about him, hiding his hands. The young man's eyes glittered. The Mibe thought, is that power swirling from the man? No, I am mistaken. I see nothing now. I wonder how she can sense sorcery. I think it's because of the, of several things. Think about it. She's it was in the dreams of Kruppa, or he was in her dreams. So she's no, had she that. was in his dream. She was in his dream. Yes. So the, all that stuff with Silver Fox and the all, the all that creation that was a act of real high sorcery, I believe. From, especially from an elder god, you have that along with this bond she's got with Silver Fox, and and then just hanging around. Dude, every time Rake 
enters a place, it talks about the pressure he exerts on the on the furniture. For goodness' sake, what you know? Think about what it does to everyone in the room. It's like, do your ears pop every time you? Mm, like you that walk. wouldn't surprise me. It's I, I wouldn't either. I mean, I get that impression from Rake. It's just like he has such vast reserve. He is power incarnate almost. It's like he, it's not like he can help it. It's like you know, I'm. It's like sorry, I'm so powerful, I can't really turn it off. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's the combination of him and the sword because yeah. there was a lot of talk of the sound of wagon wheels rolling and chains rattling whenever he yeah. was around because of the dragon of war. Yeah. So you're thinking that some of this rubbed off on the Mibe through proximity yeah. and her involvement in the Silver Fox soul transfer scenario. Yes, because she okay. still has a she still has a bond with Silver Fox as we speak. So that might be what does it in and of itself. A life link. Yes. Anamander Rake slowly faced Brood. He said, I see that the lines have been drawn. Corlat? Corlat said, I side with Caladan Brood in this, Master. Rake eyed Kalor and said, It seems you stand alone. Kalor said, It was ever thus. Mm. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Dude, what a hard, a hard man. <laughs> oh, That's I one agree. of my favorite Erickson lines. I agree. I agree. Because it's not the only time we've heard that, I think. I don't think it is either. And there's just something about that. And from what we've even seen at the beginning of this book, you know, where he's stripped of whatever it is that we see him. I mean, you know, he's he's still here. And you and I, and I know that you and I just love, we love a good villain. Mm -hmm. we, we always love a good villain, man. And I don't know quite what Calor is, but we know he ain't a nice fella. <laughs> I wonder why I'm enjoying him so much this time around. Cause I hated him so oh. much the first oh. couple times I read. Oh, I know it. I just wanted someone to, I wanted Brood to just kill that old boy just out of hand. You know, I wanted Rake to kill. I wanted Rake to kill him in particular, just stick him in the sword. I don't know. Is it just I'm older now? I think that could be part of it. It's the fact of how you and I are going through it. it makes us look at everything completely different. Mm, true. Because when you look at him, we're looking at him different. Cause we're looking at him with a lot more of like, I'm approaching this. So chapter by chapter, try not to form. I mean, I know where a lot of this is going, but I don't know the, I, you're like me. We know the general outcome of everything, but I don't remember most of the fine details. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, wow, I'm like you, I despise him so much, <laughs> especially all this talk, cut her down, cut her mm -hmm. down, strike her mm -hmm. down. I'm like, dude, it's like, kill that old boy. It's like, but now I'm like, I, I kind of like it. I kind of like him saying it was out of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, wow. Okay. The Mibe thought. Oh, a sharp reply, that. Rake's expression tightened momentarily. He said, I am not unfamiliar with that position, High King. Kalor simply nodded. Horse hooves sounded then, and Whiskey Jack rode into the clearing and drew his mount to a halt. It was unclear what he had heard, yet he acted nonetheless. Dismounting, he strode towards Silver Fox, stopping directly before her. His sword slid smoothly from its scabbard. Whiskey Jack faced Rake, Kalor, and the others in the center of the clearing, then planted his sword in the ground before him. That's very bold, given Dude, the, what a guy. who he's standing between. <laughs> so I got my fist just holding in the air. I'm fist pumping the air. Just like, yes, what a guy, dude. It's just like, it doesn't even stop. Just out. Okay, this is not good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he knows what's what. He can read the room. He don't yeah. care. Mm -hmm. He's going to stand for the right. He's the man. <laughs> Brood stepped to Whiskey Jack's side and said, with what you might face, Whiskey Jack, it would be best if you, Whiskey Jack growled, I stand here. Sorcery flowed from Rake, grainy, gray, rolled in a slow wave across the clearing, passed through Whiskey Jack effortlessly, then swallowed Silver Fox in an opaque, swirling embrace. The Mibe cried out, lurched forward, but Corlat's hand closed on her arm. She said, fear not, he but seeks to understand her, understand what she is. The sorcery frayed suddenly, flung away in tattered fragments to all sides. The Mibe hissed. She knew enough of her daughter to see, in her reappearance, that she was furious. Power, twisting like taut ropes, rose around her, nodding, bunching. The Mibe thought, oh, spirits below. I see Nigel and Tattersail both, a shared rage, and, by the abyss, another. A stolid will, a sentience slow to anger, so much like brood. Who? Is this? Oh, is this Bellardan? Gods, we are moments from tearing ourselves apart, please. I was thinking about this scenario here because Silver Fox outwardly appears to be 10 or 12 years old. Yes. I'm wondering how much of a child of that age plays into her reaction here mm -hmm. versus those shared memories she has with the other people. If 
she has the maturity of a 10 to 12 year old because sometimes she does do childish things yes like falling asleep in the chair she does seem like she's not truly embodying the adult attributes that she inherited you know, it takes a lot to grow that fast so, so i can understand the falling out in the meeting because it's taking it out on her too sometimes she asks innocent type questions of the mind yes. so i do wonder how much of the child's maturity plays into this furious response here because I have a daughter in this range and mm -hmm. when upset, it is very notable. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely said, sir. <laughs> that was very eloquently said, sir. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Something to say. So she's the force of nature then, is she? Yeah. Okay. Is it you? Is it all you at that moment? Is it like, you know what I mean? Is it like old rage you? <laughs> Well, it depends on who upset her. I mean, she's got three brothers, oh, too. No, I'm saying, is it like you or does she do you? I'm Basically, when I'm angry, I am my father. Oh. <laughs> I have become my father. Is she you when she's angry? What you're used to seeing of how mad I used to get at Fry's, like, I'm not mm. really like that anymore. Sure. I didn't think you were, but I never I never really saw you that out of control. I was like... Maybe well, I, I mean, I would be mad, but I mean, I was able to keep it under control. But yeah. I mean, back then, I was just miserable working there, so everything yeah. would upset me but no i think i can't say anymore copy that <laughs> say no more <laughs> rake said well i have never before had my hand slapped in such a fashion impressive though perilously impertinent what is it then that the child does not wish me to discover he reached over his left shoulder for dragnapur's leather wrapped handle grunting a savage curse brood unlimbered his hammer whiskey jack shifted his stance raising his own blade the Mib thought, gods know this is wrong. Kalor rasped, Rake, do you wish me on your left or right? <laughs> that statement there, it's like Kalor chill. Rake can handle this situation. <laughs> yeah. Secondarily, having recently watched Tombstone, I'm having flashbacks to the shootout at the OK Corral because everybody's ready to bear arms at this point. Yes. That's what I should have watched last night. I watched Bone Tomahawk last night. Have you seen Bone Tomahawk? I have not. Another Kurt Russell cowboy movie, right? It's almost more akin to a horror flick, Comron, than a Western. I mean, it's a Western, straight up Western, but I got to a point where I was kind of, it was all right, but it, it, and I like Kurt enough and the other guy, Richard Jenkins is in it. I really like Richard Jenkins too. That was, they're both, so they're both old boys going, you know, on, after looking for a woman kidnapped by these real primitive savages that they're, they're cannibals. Mm. And, mm -hmm. um, so I get to the end, like the last 15 minutes, and it just got to being so gruesome. And I used to, like I said, I used to have a, love, a like and love of that stuff. And as I've been getting older and here lately in particular, I just get to where I just have this loss. And that's, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, I'm enjoying losing the fact of my love of pornographically violent shows. So I stopped it right at the end, just couldn't take it anymore. Mm. And it wasn't that way through the whole movie. It was just, you know, bits and pieces kind of cropped up that made it feel like a horror movie, which I kind of dug that, but it's like, it was just going to be like, oh, well, it's a little bit kind of uncalled for. I'm like, okay, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. Enough. <laughs> yeah. So I should have watched, I should have watched that. I've been, I've been wanting to watch Westerns real bad lately. So I, so I should have just stuck with something I knew or that or Silverado. Do you like Silverado? I have never seen that. Get out of town, dude. But speaking of your love of Matt Damon, why aren't you mentioning the True Grit remake? That was awesome. You know, I've, I've seen that once, and I don't know how I feel about that. It was one of those movies that was kind of unusual in the fact that it was almost like the um, remake of Psycho. It was like a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the original. On wait, dude, I love the dude. Given your love for the Coen brothers. I do love the Coen brothers. Yeah, yeah so... They did that movie, the remake. Oh, I know. And the comedy, I just really enjoyed. I was laughing most of the movie. It's hilarious dialogue. Oh, it was no, it was good. I liked it. I'm, I'm just, I did enjoy. It. I, I kind of for. It's not one of my favorite westerns. The new one, the original, I love. Um, I think I need to see like Open Range or something like that, just to cleanse. Our Unforgiven needs to be watched. I, I need watch something. That in a long time, <laughs> dude. Make it so. <laughs> we need to watch Unforgiven this week. <laughs> Snapping tent poles startled everyone. A loud yelp from the command tent was followed by a massive, awkward flying shape exploding out from the tent's entrance. Cavorting, spinning wildly in the air, the huge wooden table the Mibe had last seen emerging from the shroud now rose above the clearing, and from one leg dangled Krupp sweet cakes fluttering <laughs> away from him. He yelped again, kicking the air with his slippered feet. He shouted, Aye, help! Krupp hates flying! <laughs> Elsewhere in the camp, 
the bridge burners completed assembling their gear. The sentries positioned to the east shouted as the news that the Black Maranth had been seen and now approached on their quarrels. Perrin, plagued by a growing unease, strode among the gathered soldiers. Off to one side, an exhausted picker sat watching him, her expression a strange mixture of dismay and admiration, and thus she was the only one to see him taking yet another forward step, then simply vanishing. Picker bolted to her feet and shouted, Oh, Hood's balls! Spindle, get quick, Ben! <laughs> a few paces away, Spindle glanced up and asked, Why? Picker shouted, Someone's just snatched Perrin! Quick, find quick, Ben, damn you! I love how Picker is looking at Perrin with dismay and admiration. Even they like the way he punished them for stealing the table from Brood. Well, it just showed he is like, it's something Whiskey Jack would have done. That's something Do Jack would have done. You know, it's one of those just brilliant little, like, little... Oh yeah, I'm glad y'all found that. Good job. Yeah, y'all just said that. You know, it's just so like so masterful. She has to admire him for that, and I, I just love that dude. I, and I, but let's let's also acknowledge the fact that we have a new swear here. <laughs> I think I've heard Hood's balls before. <laughs> That's a common one. I thought is it okay. I think so. I always thought there's so many Hood ones. It's hard to remember. Yeah, there's always like Hood's, <laughs> the Hood's toenails. I've always. Mm. moldering moccasins that was one <laughs> last week i thought it was new. Yes. yeah oh okay gracious move along sorry <laughs> there's shades of that scene with coltane and the sappers the way he handled that and the way yes. Aaron handled the table situation yes yes very nice sir that was a very, very nice yeah a very similar situation yeah earned him lots of respect mm-hmm the vision of busy soldiers vanished before Perrin's eyes, and from a blurred veil that swiftly parted, Perrin found himself facing Rake and Kalor, both with weapons drawn, and behind them the Mibe and Corlat, with a ring of alert Tist and D just beyond. Countless eyes fixed on him, then darted up over his right shoulder, then back down. No one moved, and Perrin realized he was not alone in his shock. Someone shouted, Help! Perrin spun, then looked up. An enormous wooden table twisted silently in the air, Krupp's round, silk-flowing form hanging beneath it. On the underside of the table, painted in bright, now glowing colors, was the image of a man. Slowly blinking in and out of Perrin's view, it was a few moments before he recognized the figure's face. He thought, that's me. Pain ripped into him, a black surge that swallowed him whole. The Mibe saw Perrin buckle, drop to his knees, as if drawing tight around an overwhelming agony. Her attention darted to her daughter, in time to see those bound coils of power snake outward from Silver Fox, slipping round and past the motionless forms of Brood and Whiskey Jack, then upward to touch the table. The four legs snapped. With a shriek, Krupp plunged earthward, to land in a flailing of limbs and silk among a crowd of Tist Andy. Cries and grunts of pain and surprise followed. Man, those poor Tist Andy. <laughs> Because you know Krupp sustained not one scratch or any even hair out of place, but he whooped a few fellas landing on him. <laughs> uh-huh. The table now steadied, the underside facing Rake and Kalor, the image of Perrin coruscating <laughs> with sorcery. Wisps of it reached down to Perrin in glittering silver chains. Was this crepuscular ochre coruscation or just your average old run-of-the-mill coruscation here? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if ochre is uh, a dominant feature of this <laughs> coruscation at present <laughs> beside her someone said well that's the largest card of the deck i've ever seen the mime pulled her gaze away stared wide-eyed at the mage standing beside her she said quick ben he stepped forward then raising his hands he said please excuse my interruption everyone whilst it seems that a confrontation is desired by many of you here might i suggest the absence of uh wisdom in inviting violence here and now, when it is clear that the significance of all that seems to be occurring is as yet undetermined. The risks precipitate action right now. Well, I trust you see what I mean. Rake stared at Quick Ben for a moment, then, with a faint smile, sheathed his sword. He said, Cautious words, but wise ones. Who might you be, sir? Quick Ben said, Just a soldier, son of darkness, come to retrieve my captain. At that moment, Krupp emerged from the muttering, no doubt bruised crowd that had cushioned his fall. <laughs> Brushing dust from his silks, he strode seemingly unaware to halt directly between the kneeling Perrin and Rake. He looked up then, blinking owlishly, and said, What an unseemly conclusion to Krupp's post-breakfast repast. Has the meeting adjourned? <laughs> Dude, he's basically a hobbit. 
Yeah. He was eating second breakfast when the table flew out of the tent. <laughs> I've always assumed that Krupp is always at one meal or another through his day is the, is the impression I get from this fellow all the time. Sounds about right. Perrin was insensate to the power bleeding into him. In his mind, he was falling, falling, then striking hard, rough flagstones, the clash of his armor echoing. The pain was gone. Gasping, shivering uncontrollably, he raised his head. In the dim light of reflected lanterns, he saw that he was sprawled in a narrow, low-ceilinged hallway. Heavy twin doors divided the strangely uneven wall on his right. On his left, opposite the doors, was a wide entrance, with niches set in its flanking walls. On all sides, the stone appeared rough, undressed, resembling the bark of trees. A heavier door of sheeted bronze, black and pitted, was at the far end, eight or so paces distant. Two shapeless humps lay at the inner threshold. Perrin thought, where? What? I imagine this would be quite jarring. Oh, yeah, dude. It's double jarring. Think he just moved from one place to another within the camp, and then he moves to yet somewhere else. Yeah, it's like, bam, bam. And then it's like within, and then all of a sudden, bam, bam, again. You're like, whoa. It's a triple whammy because yeah. he got teleported. Then he sees that table. He's like, hey, that's me. And then yeah, now yeah. he's teleporting again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of wow. It'd be hard to kind of get a grip of what's going on. <laughs> Perrin pushed himself upright, using one wall for support. His gaze was drawn once again to the shapes at the foot of the bronze door. He staggered closer. A man swathed in the tightly bound clothes of an assassin, his narrow, smooth-shaven face set in a peaceful expression, his long black braids still glistening with oil. An old-fashioned crossbow lay beside him. Lying at his side, a woman her cloak stretched and twisted as if the man had dragged her across the threshold. She had a nasty head wound, and from the blood smears on the flagstones, she had other wounds as well. Perrin thought, they're both Daru. Wait, I have seen the man before, at Simtal's fate, and the woman, she's the guildmaster. Ralik, Nam, and Vorkin, both of whom vanished the night of the fate. I am in Darujistan then, I must be. Whoa, that's interesting to find both of them here. Given what we've learned of the Azath, in Deadhouse Gates, I'm eager to learn more about what role they will play for the Azath in general. Absolutely. Because you know how I feel about Ralic. I'm really glad to see him at least appear to, you know, he at least appears alive, I guess. <laughs> he's, he's here. So it's like, okay, that's good. Good, good. Yeah. Perrin scowled as Silver Fox's words returned to him. The table, the card, with my image painted upon it. Genesand rule. The unaligned, newly come to the deck of dragons, powers unknown. I have walked within a sword. It seems now that I can walk anywhere. And this place, this place, I am in the Finest house. Gods, I am in a house of the Azath. He heard a sound, a shuffling motion approaching the twin doors opposite and slowly turned, reaching for the sword belted at his hip. The wooden portals swung wide. Hissing, Perrin backed up a step his blade sliding from its scabbard. The Jagut standing before him was almost fleshless, ribs snapped and jutting, strips of flayed skin and muscle hanging in ghastly ribbons from his arms. His gaunt, ravaged face twisted as he bared his tusks. He rumbled, Welcome. I am raced. Guardian. Prisoner. Damned. The Azath greets you, as much as Sweating Stone is able. I see that, unlike the two sleeping in the threshold, you have no need for doors. So be it. He lurched a step closer, then cocked his head and said, Ah, you are not here in truth, only your spirit. The Azath chose Raced as its guardian? <laughs> That's pretty wild. I guess there is no judgment from the Azath on what you did while alive, only that you agreed to protect the house. I guess so, and it's interesting because here and, and also from Dead House, we have another Jagoot there, Gothos guarding this is it because their their power makes them ideal guardians i don't know because moby i don't think he's anywhere near as powerful as gothos or raced yeah that's kind of what i'm thinking what's funny are they, are they just uh are the jagut the only ones that can have a normal life inside of a uh, azath like it's like after spending countless millennia attempting to destroy the universe i just needed a regular job to help me unwind and make me feel good for myself you know is this gothos mm. is did, did he say this somewhere <laughs> i don't think gothos was a tyrant like race was a tyrant this is true is gothos a prisoner or is he just he he is a prisoner isn't it because because ikarium was trying to free him it is a matter of interpretation okay <laughs> from ikarium's point of view he thinks his dad is a prisoner that's true but from gothos's point of view he gets to chill out 
not have a lot of visitors. Right. He gets left alone. He's protected. People can't get in there. And for a Jagoot, that comfort is probably pretty good because yeah. otherwise you're going to be constantly worried about getting hunted down by Talani mass <laughs> that are basically only a lot, not, not alive, but their existence is only to destroy you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, can, I just have another flash here. It's like, it's like, you see Gothos peering at the window of the, of the dead house going, oh crud. There's some Talani mass moving in the neighborhood. Time to move. <laughs> <laughs> Time to move. <laughs> so from race perspective, I don't know if he looks at it the same as Gothos would, because it sounded like Gothos was happy where he was. Well, and Gothos didn't sound like he was dead <laughs> either. So this, oh, uh, yeah, it's, true. A, it's like, yeah. <laughs> or uh, whatever. I don't know what's up with him, but race is burying his wounds in this house. Maybe he'll heal up over time. I don't know. Um, I don't but, think he will. I don't think he I mean, will. He was already a mummy yeah, when exactly. he came out of the ground. So I don't think this has done much for his appearance over time. So No. Perrin said, if you say so. His thoughts went back to the last night of the fate, the debacle in the estate's garden, memories of sorcery, detonations, and Perrin's unexpected journey into the realm of shadow, the hounds, and cotillion. He thought, a journey such as this one. He studied race, then thought, Hood, take me. This creature is the Jagoot Tyrant, the one freed by Lorne and the Talani Mass, or rather, what's left of him. Perrin asked, why am I here? Raced's grin broadened. He said, follow me. Raced stepped into the corridor and turned to his right, each bared foot dragging, grinding, as if the bones beneath the skin were all broken. That would be a terrible noise. Oh, yeah. Seven paces along, the hallway ended with a door on the left and another directly in front. Raced opened the one on the left, revealing a circular chamber beyond, surrounding spiral stairs of root-bound wood. There was no light, yet Perrin found he could see well enough. They went down. The air warmed, grew moist, and sweet with the smell of humus. As they walked, Perrin said, Raced, the assassin and the guildmaster. You said they were asleep. How long have they been lying there? Raced said, I measure no days within the house, mortal. The Azath took me. Since that event, a few outsiders have sought entry, have probed with sorceries, have indeed walked the yard, but the house has denied them all. The two within the threshold were there when I awoke and have not moved since. It follows then that the house has already chosen, Perrin thought, as the dead house did Kelan Ved and Dancer. He said, all very well, but can't you awaken them? Race said, I have not tried. Perrin asked, why not? Race paused and glanced back up at Perrin. He said, there has been no need. They resumed the descent and Perrin asked, are they guardians as well? Race said, not directly. I suffice, mortal. Unwitting servants, perhaps. Your servants. Perrin said, mine? I don't need servants. I don't want servants. Furthermore, I don't care what the Azath expects of me. The house is mistaken in its faith, Race. And you can tell it that for me. Tell it to find another, another whatever I am supposed to be. Raced said, you are the master of the deck. Such things cannot be undone. Perrin growled, the what? Hood's breath. The Azath had better find a way of undoing that choice, Jagoot. Race said, it cannot be undone, as I've already told you. A master is needed, so here you are. Perrin said, I don't want it. There is that petulant, childish attitude again. Man up, Perrin. Yeah, it's kind of like the Cartman, but I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> Race said, I weep a river of tears for your plight, mortal. <laughs> ah, we have arrived. They stood on a landing. Perrin judged that they had gone down six, perhaps seven levels into the bowels of the earth. The stone walls had disappeared, leaving only gloom. The ground underfoot a mat of snaking roots. Raced said, I can go no further, master of the deck. Walk into the darkness. Perrin asked, and if I refuse? Race said, then I kill you. Perrin muttered, unforgiving bastard, this Azath. Race said, I kill you, not for the Azath, but for the wasted effort of this journey. Mortal, you've no sense of humor. <laughs> Perrin said, and you think you do? Race said, if you refuse to go further, then nothing. Apart from irritating me, that is. The Azath is patient. You will make the journey eventually, though the privilege of my escort occurs but once, and that once is now. Perrin said, meaning I won't have your cheery company next time? How will I cope? Race said, miserably, if there was justice in the world. Perrin faced the darkness, then asked, and is there? Race said, you asked that of a Jagoot? Now, do we stand here forever? 
parents sighed. All right, all right. Pick any direction? Ray shrugged and said, they are all one to me. Grinning in spite of himself, Perrin strode forward. Then he paused and half turned. He said, raced. You said the Azath has need for a master of the deck. Why? What's happened? Ray spared his tusks and said, a war has begun. Perrin fought back a sudden shiver. He asked, a war? Involving the houses of the Azath? Ray said, no entity will be spared, mortal. Not the houses, not the gods. Not you, human nor a single one of your short-lived, insignificant comrades. Perrin grimaced and said, I have enough wars to deal with as it is, Race. Race said, they are all one. Perrin said, I don't want to think about any of this. Race said, then don't. <laughs> Man, he sounds like a philosopher. Hey, at least he's <laughs> chilling out a little bit now. <laughs> yeah, it's quite different than what we remember. Yes. Yeah, what little we saw of him, he was just ready to kill everything and take over everything. After a moment, Perrin realized his glare was wasted on Raced. He swung about and resumed his journey. With his third step, his boots struck flagstone instead of root, and the darkness around him dissolved, revealing, in a faint, dull yellow light, a vast concourse. Its edges, visible a hundred paces or more in every direction, seemed to drift back into gloom. Of Raced and the wooden stairs, there was no sign. Perrin's attention was drawn to the flagstones beneath him. Carved into their bleached surfaces were cards of the Deck of Dragons. He thought, no, more than just the deck of dragons. There's cards here I don't recognize. Lost houses and countless forgotten unaligned houses. And he stepped forward, crouched down to study one image. As he focused his attention on it, the world around him faded and he felt himself moving into the carved scene. A chill wind slid across his face, the air smelling of mud and wet fur. <laughs> ah, it sounds like a rainy winter day after I let these dogs back in from the oh. backyard. Yeah, I imagine so. Perrin could feel the earth beneath his boots, cold and yielding. Somewhere in the distance, crows cackled. The strange hut he had seen in the carving now stood before him, long and humped, the huge bones and long tusks comprising its framework visible between gaps in the thick, umber fur, skins clothing it. He thought houses and holds, the first efforts at building. People once dwelt within such structures, like living inside the ribcage of a dragon. Gods, those tusks are huge. Whatever beast these bones had come from must have been massive. I can travel at will, it seems, into each and every card of every deck that ever existed. What a power to gain, with absolutely no guidance. No wiki to look up the rules, no forums, <laughs> no YouTube tutorials, nothing. Dude, I cringe at the idea of the lack of YouTube tutorials. Good gracious, I've been that saved my bacon more than once. <laughs> It'd be like trying to figure out all the systems in Elden Ring with no guidance. Any of those FromSoft games. Okay. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, because they are notorious for not giving you much information at all. Okay. <laughs> Amidst the surge of wonder and excitement he felt ran an undercurrent of terror. The deck possessed a host of unpleasant places. He thought, and this one? A small stone-lined hearth smoldered before the hut's entrance. Wreathed in the smoke was a rack made of branches on which hung strips of meat. The clearing Perrin now saw was ringed with weathered skulls, doubtless from the beasts whose bones formed the framework of the hut itself. The skulls faced inward, and he could see by the long yellowed molars in the jaws that the animals had been eaters of plants, not flesh. Perrin approached the hut's entrance. The skulls of carnivores hung down from the doorway's ivory frame, forcing him to duck as he entered. He thought, swiftly abandoned, from the looks of it, as if the dwellers just left but moments ago. At the far end sat twin thrones, squat and robust, made entirely of bones, on a raised dais of ochre-stained oh, human skulls. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, here we go. We got a new one. Well. <laughs> he thought, well, close enough to human in any case, more like Talani Mass. Knowledge blossomed in his mind. He knew the name of this place, knew it deep in his soul. Ah, so no wiki or tutorial is needed. He gets to download it like Neo in the Matrix, just Dude, directly into his brain. That's pretty sweet. All Perry needs to do is jack into the Bruce Lee universe and everyone can be kung fu fighting. Cute music. <laughs> <laughs> Perrin thought, the hold of the beasts. Long before the first throne, this was the heart of the Talani Mass's power, their spirit world when they were still flesh and blood, when they still possessed spirits to be worshipped and revered, long before they initiated the ritual of Talon, and so came to outlast their own pantheon. A realm then abandoned, 
lost to its makers. What then is the warren of Talon that the Talani mass now use? Ah, that warren must have been born from the ritual itself, a physical manifestation of their vow of immortality, perhaps. Aspected, not of life, nor even death. Aspected of dust. I wonder why the throne would sit atop their own skulls. That's a good question. And the other thing, it's uh, so this is the first home of the Talon and Is it, this would be their warren that they first had? Correct. Is that is that how I'm reading this? If I interpreted this correctly, this is what they worshipped before they became Talon I Mass. What's wild about that? I mean, think about this: is even though this is abandoned, there's still like. The fire is smoking here. Yeah, the meat is hanging over. It's waiting for someone to come take it. It looked like they just left. Yeah, it's like, is this what Kellen Van and Dancer walked into? Essentially for Shadow? Not this. Not this, but I mean, but essentially the same situation, but for Shadow? Maybe it was exactly like this. Is it open for someone to take? It seems like no one's occupying this throne. It certainly seems that way. Okay. There's probably a lot of unoccupied realms out there that's true which makes you wonder why kelon ved and dancer chose shadow maybe it chooses you oh interesting maybe kelon ved was maybe he was was he a a practitioner of shadow that's never said anything about kelon Ved, other than the fact that we know he is shadow throne and that he was pretty ticked off at ben at quick ben when he snaked his way in there in gardens and he got into shadow and realize he was a traitor. So would that make him also a practitioner of just shadow before? So maybe that's why he just but just kind of gravitated. Maybe he maybe that's how he became aware. Maybe because he, he's a schemer. So maybe he became aware of the empty throne through his schemes. We might need to read more. Esselmont's doing the prequel books right that's, now. That's right. Maybe there's more information in there. I think I've already bought them. I think. <laughs> I think think I've already, it's like, this is a Paths to Ascendancy series, I believe. Yes. And I I think a new one just came out here in the past few months. Dancer's Lament. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Parents stood unmoving for a time, struggling to comprehend the seemingly depthless layers of tragedy that were the burdens of the Talani Mass. He thought, oh my, they've outlasted their own gods. They exist in a world of dust in truth memories untethered, an eternal existence, no end in sight. He was filled with sorrow. He thought, Beru Fend, so alone now, so alone for so long, yet now they are gathering, coming to the child seeking benediction and something more. Perrin stepped back and stood on the flagstones once again. <laughs> What's up? Is he looking for that slaw. That's what we're looking for, something more. <laughs> something good slaw. Perrin stepped back and stood on the flagstones once again. With an effort, he pulled his eyes from the carved hold of beasts, as he now knew the card was called. But why were there two thrones and not just one? Another etched stone, a dozen paces to his left, caught his attention. A throbbing, crimson glow suffused the air directly above it. He walked to it, looked down. The image of a sleeping woman, as seen from above, dominated the flagstone. Her flesh seemed to spin and swirl. Perrin slowly lowered himself into a crouch, his eyes narrowing. Her skin was depthless, revealing ever more detail as Perrin's vision was drawn ever closer. He thought, skin, not skin, forests, sweeps of bedrock, the seething floor of the oceans, fissures in the flesh of the world. She is Burn. She is the sleeping goddess. Then he saw the flaw, the marring, a dark, separating welt. Waves of nausea swept through Perrin, yet he would not look away. There at the wound's heart, a humped, kneeling, broken figure, chained, chained to Burns' own flesh. From the figure, down the length of the chains, poison flowed into the sleeping goddess. He thought, she sensed the sickness coming, seeking claws into her, sensed and chose to sleep. Less than 2,000 years ago, she chose to sleep. She sought to escape the prison of her own flesh in order to do battle with the one who was killing that flesh. She, O oh gods above and below, She made of herself a weapon, her entire spirit, all its power, into a single forging, a hammer, a hammer capable of breaking, breaking anything. And Byrne then found a man to wield it, Caladan Brood. Mm. Whoa, that's a lot of power invested in that hammer. That's a lot. When you think about that, that's... Is this as powerful as Dragnapur? It's different. Yeah, but it's very similar in a way. How so? 
just from a power level perspective. Did we learn what was the heart of Dragnapur? I can't remember. Yes? Yes. Okay. In Guardians of the Moon, they said it was the gate to darkness. That's what I was thinking. Okay. So it's the gate of darkness, but this is actually a manifestation of Burn herself? Well, it sounds like she put all her power into forging it. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. The way I interpret it is if he swung that thing hard enough, it'd be like a asteroid hitting the planet. Well, that's the impression I get too, is that he could wipe out the entirety of, of the world and it would almost be like welcomed. Would she wake up, destroy all of creation by her waking and then just let's go back to sleep and start again? I mean, that can't be the case. She's only been asleep for a couple thousand years. Yeah, she would start over. But she wouldn't be sick. Right. That's what I'm getting. We should be able to heal, but it would cost everything on the planet. <laughs> yes. Everything. So actually, I don't know about that. Let's read this next paragraph okay. here. But breaking the chains meant freeing the crippled God and an unchained crippled God meant an unleashing of vengeance enough to sweep all life from the surface of this world. And yet burn the sleeping goddess was indifferent to that she would simply begin again. Okay. So maybe the hammer isn't powerful enough to destroy everything. Okay. They're thinking that the crippled God would do it when he was freed. Okay. Maybe the hammer can just break the chains that bind the crippled God to her. Oh, to her. Okay. Okay. Now Perrin saw the truth. He thought he refuses. The bastard refuses to defy the crippled God's unleashing of a deadly will that would see us all destroyed. Caladan Rude refuses her. Gasping, Perrin pulled himself away, pushed himself upright, staggered back, and was at Raist's side once again. Raist's tusks glimmered. He asked, have you found knowledge a gift or a curse? Perrin thought, too prescient a question. He said, both Raist. Raist asked, and which do you choose to embrace? Perrin said, I don't know what you mean. Raist said, you are weeping, mortal. In joy or sorrow? Perrin grimaced, then gruffly said, I want to leave, Raist. I want to return. In return he shall in next week's episode. We're going to stop right there, and we will pick up right there next week. Yes. Nice. Man, a lot of stuff happened. A lot of stuff, man. For standout moments, the showdown in the camp between the forces defending Silver Fox and the others. That was pretty tense. That's nice. We could get that Kelly's Heroes thick kind of thing going. Remember when they kind of three walked down the street? There, <laughs> the spurs were jingling, pistols at the ready. It's something like that, you know. So I've got mm -hmm. Kelly's Heroes on the brand again because my dad mentioned he wanted to watch that. He saw that I had it in my stuff. He goes, oh. It's a good time to watch that since Donald Sutherland just died. Yeah, I watched it right before he passed, as a matter of fact. So I, I can always watch Kelly's Heroes. <laughs> I enjoyed Picker looking at Perrin with both dismay and admiration. Oh, I, I love that too. I love how Pick, uh, Perrin is kind of starting to... He's really won his team. His crew have really, they like him now. Even if, you know, he, he's their boss, but they like him. They're starting to. I don't know if everybody does yet. I think if you get Picker liking somebody, you'll get everyone else liking him. Yeah, because Mallet seems to keep a distance from him, but he seems to care about him not having bad stuff happen to him. Yes. Well, I'm assuming that's just part of his healer training and his war, and he just doesn't like seeing anyone in pain. Yeah. The whole parent getting kidnapped by the table thing was yeah. pretty cool yeah and that poor guy he had the neo experience in about 10 minutes what neo had a few days mm. Mm. you know jump jump okay now you're, here's the matrix you can do this okay cool check it out <laughs> see ya <laughs> and, and it's, like, it's like you're home okay okay what do i do with this information it's like a, wow i don't know but <laughs> dude now that you're saying it this way, it's almost like that conversation with Silver Fox all night was like the conversation with Morpheus. <laughs> where she's unloading all this stuff on him. And he's like, no, I don't want it. No, nope. no, nope. 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 taking the blue pill. No, nope. no. Nope. <laughs> oh. Well, they force fed him the red pill. Yeah, he they didn't have, have a didn't have a choice. Well, I think he took the blue one and puked it up. And then they were just like, well, I guess all we got left is a red one for you, so. Krupp's second breakfast getting interrupted by getting tangled up in the legs of that table <laughs> as it flew from the tent what a and what a great like, i mentioned this last week and the week before because it is this chapter and again this chapter is core memory everything because i mean think about it we have just witnessed a new creation of a card parent being gifted powers out of nowhere and kruppa you know making a fool of himself i said kruppa but, it's krupp, 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 i'm sorry krupp, 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 sorry. krupp's second breakfast krupp's second breakfast but um <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot going on in this chapter, man. It's a little busy chapter. We stopped in the middle of it because yeah. it just keeps going right after this. It was a yeah. good stopping point. A great stopping point. Raced, Ralik Nam, and Vorkin are back. Yes. Really excited about that. The entire conversation between Raced and Perrin. I enjoy Raced's dry humor. Okay. 
Dad, come to me. I was going to say, what you say is hero is dry. It was like that. <laughs> as dry as the desert sun. That's some dry humor, but yeah. Parents trip into the beast hold. There's some oh. interesting details in that tent. Man. Yeah, it, it just a casual offhanding unloading of information on us about oh yeah by the way here's this is the original talan i mass warren that's empty mm. now but this is empty but now they, they they've created their own warren <laughs> by the way it's like wow that's that's just thrown out there it's just like by the way <laughs> mm -hmm. and finally perrin learning the truth behind burn's sickness and her pact with brood yeah dude that's wild and super cool dude yeah specifically finding out that brood is withholding and not fulfilling his side of the vow yeah it's interesting I'd like to learn more about what's holding him back yeah me too maybe we'll find out next week i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> maybe next year yeah right hopefully <laughs> <laughs> all right billy great job tonight hey man great episode dude you got any final thoughts before we drop off here no just great episode looking forward to the conclusion of this fantastic core memory chapter here yes four parts yes first four the conclusion of, next week and it's all core mm -hmm. <laughs> all core memory yeah. people yeah all right thanks everybody we'll see you next week see y'all next week we thank you all for joining us today again we really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today if you would like to support our show you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com where you can find our patreon link depending on the platform you're listening from it may also be in the episode description and if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.